Lord of all he surveys, Africa's king of the beasts. A study in strength, a supercharged hunting beast, the most symbolic ever, commanding beauty and steely-eyed power. Nothing else quite says Africa like a lion. The lion has long been called king of the beasts, but there was a time when other animals disputed his right to rule. The antelope claimed they should, as they were swift as the wind. The elephant trumpeted his challenge, saying, I am wisest and stronger than you. I can crush you underfoot. The baboon, too, demanded to be king. His agility and cunning gave him the right, he said. And yet another, the eagle, staked his claim, because he had the power of flight. But the lion just prowled his kingdom, looking regal, ignoring their rebellious demand. And the antelope fled before him. The elephant became nervous and retreated. The baboon shot up the nearest tree. And the eagle soared far out of reach. None could challenge the lion's supremacy. He knew it was just words. Not one had the courage to be king. Lions are big cats. The record holder died in South Africa in 1936. A man-eater as heavy as five adult humans. Only the tiger is a bigger cat. An average male is an impressive monarch. Standing one and a quarter meters at the shoulder, his weight perhaps that of three grown people. Lions see very well, and six times better than us at night. They look out from large golden eyes with binocular vision, good at calculating distance and separating prey from background. A lion's whiskers are very sensitive antennae, and the pattern of spots where they sprout is as unique to each cat as a human fingerprint. A lion is a study in controlled power. Everything about it says strength. From fangs cleaned with the toothbrush of the hide and bone it gnaws, to short jaws capable of a crushing bite. Africa's top carnivore has immensely powerful neck and jaws. Its real strength lies there and in its forequarters, enabling it to drag dead weights much heavier than itself. Lions tuck their claws away in special pockets when they're not using them. These spring-loaded switchblades need to be sheathed to save wear and tear, especially when padding round their kingdom. Young cubs are spotty creatures. Spots fade gradually, but sometimes just a ghost of them remains. Their coloration helps hide them when they're young and small and vulnerable. Just very rarely, a white lion is born. It's not an albino, but a lion with a faulty gene, so it lacks the usual color in its hair shafts. It may have had white or tawny parents. This ethereal-looking animal has yellow eyes and a black nose, not albino pink. 
the great hallmark of a male is his mane. Testosterone controls the growth of this magnificent ruff, which advertises his status and protects his neck. But it's a nuisance in bushy country. Stress can make a lion lose handfuls of mane, but this one's having a bad hair day for a different reason. It's not a he, it's a she, a female overdosed with testosterone. An odd girl out, very close to being an it, and not known to have mated. All lions, including India's few, belong to exactly the same species. There are no subspecies to this part of the cat family. A pride of lions is so familiar, it's easy to forget it's something very special, because lions are the only cats that live in a group, and it's the key to their success. The pride is almost entirely a sisterhood of closely or distantly related females. The females are usually in a pride for life, but not males. They are evicted at about three years and can have a very tough time of it after that. The only full-grown males tolerated around the pride are the temporary reigning monarchs. They're in a closely bonded coalition, usually of two or three. Any fewer than that, and they couldn't take over a pride to get access to the females and mate. The males are kept on their toes when the females are on heat. Mating is their reward for providing an armed guard to protect females and cubs against other coalitions who will kill cubs if they take over. Once a male has laid claim to a female, his allies usually keep a respectful distance, but not always. Sometimes a male coalition has territories which encompass those of several prides. This big male has one overlapping the border of Botswana and Namibia. He strides round it confidently, watching for rivals who might slip in and try to mate with the females under his protection. He checks the air for those telltale female scents, the ones that say they're on heat. Beefy muscles and a splendid mane are his status symbols, but he's like a weightlifter who sacrificed speed for strength. He's slower off the mark than the sleek females he seeks to impress. Not that that troubles them. Mane and muscles indicate he's a survivor despite his handicaps. Good breeding blood flows in those kingly veins. And when she chooses, the lioness shows willing to mingle it with hers. and the male dutifully picks up his cue. A ruling male is likely to have a short reign, usually just two years, so he must make the most of it and mate often, whenever the chance arises.
For about six days, he sticks to her like glue. And throughout the day, every 20 minutes or so between rests, they mate. The need to do so is a real slave driver. Even at nightfall, there's no let up. His sperm count probably drops to zero, not that he'd know. He won't quit until she's out of estrus and stops soliciting. There's no other way to try and make sure her cubs are his. A female is pregnant three and a half months, longer than any other cat. As the safety of her newborn is paramount, she gives birth in hiding. She moves her cubs from den to den for their first six weeks and only leaves to hunt and eat. While she's away, there's no one to watch over them. Her bundles of fluff are now old enough to join the pride where there's not just mum to keep an eye on them. In a close unit like the pride, lionesses look after each other's cubs attention seekers that need discipline. Even non-related females will put up with typical cheeky kittenish behavior if it doesn't go too far. So close is the pride bond that females with cubs the same age happily pool their resources. They play and groom and suckle across the board. It's a real working commune with plenty of childminders. One of the first things a new male coalition does when it takes over is kill young cubs. This is not cruelty nor viciousness but a simple, overwhelming need to breed. With no young to rear, the females will mate again. Both have the same drive to pass on their genes. So a pride may have several litters the same age, or with perhaps one shared parent. And their bond leads the females to share cub care, even down to suckling. When it's about three months old, a cub starts having a crack at stalking. This is a basic lesson in catching food and earning its keep. First experiments are always conducted on a relative. An experimental throat tackle, something it'll eventually do on prey. Hunting is learned and genetically hardwired and instinctive. It's never too soon to find out why bark grows on trees, to keep a lion's claws sharp. But at this age, on a milk diet, toothpicks are unnecessary. Older cubs are above such child's play. They're into learning how to knock down prey, only not the real thing just yet. The older they get, the rougher they play. Claws are sheathed, but a playful swipe has substantial muscle behind it. It's a little early, though, to try out some lessons. Growing up in this society is all about learning how to survive. And that revolves around food.
Lions can rarely eat in peace. The smell of death quickly attracts scavengers. A large kill provides plenty of scraps, which a black-backed jackal snatches, if it dares. But stealing is dangerous, like playing Russian roulette. Scrounging off a big cat may be nerve-wracking, but it can be the way to survive, and jackals are very good at that. But the chief scavenger and lion competitor is this animal, the hyena. Though his stomach looks bursting, this big male is not going to give up his kill. A large enough hyena pack can drive lions from their kill, but in this case, the male has backup. Hyenas and the rest must just sit it out. In a single sitting, a hungry lion can devour about 50 kilos, like eating an adolescent human. Even weighed down like that, he still has energy to drag his kill. Just half a dead buffalo must easily weigh as much as he does. Just try stealing it now. A group of lions can naturally defend a kill better than one, and that's another big advantage of their unique social lifestyle. Lion and hyena are rivals with a deadly relationship, but this time, the hyenas know they're beaten. The lush green heart of the Kalahari is the Okavango, a place of many herbivores. And their predators. Buffalo are extremely dangerous for a lion to attack. But in water, they can be sitting ducks. suffocating. It can be a slow way to go. Youth and inexperience make them more of a hindrance.
the lions won't eat the buffalo calf here, they'll drag it clear. The pride gathers round. The cubs are still hesitant and awkward, but they'll quickly learn what to do by copying their elders. A buffalo is normally too big and dangerous for a lioness to tackle alone, but a calf separated from its mother was easy game. Meal times have a pecking order. Normally, adults feed first. Today, they stand back and allow the cubs to. don't show the same good manners towards each other. The bigger a kill, the more food. Group living means there are more lions to make big kills, but some prey animals are small, and this one, the warthog, provides lions with many a meal. Chief breadwinners for the pride are the females. They often use teamwork to hunt. A pincer tactic by two may cut off escape. Warthogs don't see very well, and they frequently trot right into a pride without even noticing, until it's too late. There's a lineup of keen and hungry spectators. There won't be much to go round, but they all move in. Not a scrap of water will be left, not even tusks. The downside of group life is that meals must be shared. In places where there's a long dry season, many prides rely on warthogs to tide them over until the rains. After a meal, a drink to help digestion. The pride has hardly finished eating when in come the keenest eyed scavengers, the vultures. They can spot a far distant lion kill from high in the air. Some diners are still at it, but the vultures will head the food queue. Surprisingly, lions themselves scavenge as much as 30% of their food in the dry season. They can see circling vultures two kilometers off and know exactly what it means.
lion's usual home is the savanna. In some parts of Africa, they live along the edge of forest and in arid areas too. Food dictates the size of a pride and its territory. Sometimes a home that looks perfect because it's full of prey isn't. It's just the sort of place to attract strong competition from other meat eaters. Being top of the food pile doesn't mean a lion has a cushy life. If prey is thin on the ground, a pride may need a territory bigger than Paris, but in really good habitat, something only like a small town. Where the grass is greener, the hunting's easier. Running water can make a lion's life a lot more comfortable, and water in the dry season has the pull of a city's bright lights. Lions can't resist them, because water holes are where the prey is, and because lions need water, like everyone else. A big bull elephant is about the only animal able to lay down the law to a lion. One nil to the elephant. Conflict is a fact of life in the dry season, when everyone's after the same evaporating lifelines. Hot and thirsty lions just have to sit and swelter. In Zimbabwe's Mana Pools region, prides have territories of over 200 square kilometers. It sounds a lot, but it isn't. It's an area where water comes and goes as the pools fill up in the rains, then vanish in the dry. When it's wet and green, it's full of meat on the hoof. In lion land, females hold the territories. It's where most were born and schooled in what to eat and where and when. And it's the female who usually leaps to the defense of her home, not the male. He'll only fight off other males, but she has her cubs to think of and needs to make sure other prides don't steal her prey. The dry season in the Okavango harsh and stressful, a long wait for rain to rescue everyone from drought, hunger and heat. The bush is tinder dry, fires break out, making life even worse. For most, it's a hard slog to find food and water in a landscape brittle with drought. But then the rains come. are still doing what lions do best, relaxing. There's fresh blood around now, newborn herbivores.
The Okavango's vast flat delta flows strongly again, its intricate maze of waterways fully topped up. This rich, lush region is one of the very best homes Africa can offer a lion. And the proof is that here small territories provide a living to large prides because they have so much to eat. And this food dependency began a very long time ago. Just under 40 million years ago, the first cat-like creatures rolled off the production line. The earliest looked like a mongoose, lithe, intelligent, a capable and successful hunter. This was a time of global cooling. The lush forests that grew everywhere began to shrink and grassland took over, the habitat of herbivores. And that paved the way for more carnivores. Pseudolyrus followed on from the mongoose-like first cat ancestor. It evolved in Africa and was as big as a leopard and as good a tree climber. Only eight million years ago, the modern cat family, the Felidae, made their appearance. The first of these cats was no bigger than a domestic cat, but probably behaved like an African wild cat. This early species did well, fed by a population explosion of rats and mice. And from those first felids of eight million years ago came all of today's wildcats, including lions. Lions are seriously laid back. When they're not out looking for a bite, they're snoozing, which is most of the time. Most humans know where their next meal's coming from. A lion doesn't. So lazing makes sense. It saves energy. Plus, a lion's heart is small relative to its size, so if it rushed about all day, it'd easily overheat. But when it's time to hunt, gone is all shred of indolence. A big, solid predator like a lion relies on sneaking close to prey before the surprise assault. Especially important in a wide open place like the Serengeti. Hunting strategy number one. Lie down and lull them into a false sense of security. and she's already been forgotten. Now she starts to stalk. First-class muscle control and an extremely supple, flexible spine enable her to move like this. Lions are now known to calculate exactly the right moment to charge. If they're close enough when the prey sees them, they'll do it. She should be close enough now, and she's still out of sight and out of mind. When she goes, she can do naught to nearly 60 kilometers in just four seconds. A turbo car on four legs. something went wrong, and it often does. Four out of five lion chases fail. A successful hunt is not just skill, it's luck.
Lions usually walk in crocodile, mothers in front, cubs in the rear. They move little in the day. Dawn, dusk and night are their active times when it's cooler and keen night vision tilts the hunting odds in their favor. Often they follow herds of buffalo. Lions are not like their larger cousins, the tigers, who love to be up to their necks in water. But in some parts of Africa, the reputedly water-shy lion swims regularly. If it lives in Botswana's Okavango, it hasn't much choice. Getting wet is part of life if rivers run through its territory. A good doggy paddle gets them where they want to be. The most chilling sound in all Africa, a lion's roar. This thunderous greeting to the dawn has the same decibels as a small plane taking off. At night, in good conditions, a roar can carry nearly four kilometers. Lions roar most at dusk and dawn, because that's when sound carries best, and both sexes roar, not just the male. A roar can be an invisible barbed wire fence to demarcate a territory and warn off intruders. Roars are also contact calls. Animals that live in groups need a way of telling the others who they are and where they are over a distance. A full-blooded roar only comes with adulthood. To make a warning more fearsome, lions often roar in chorus. That should head them off at the pass. A cub's calls are hardly earth-shattering, like boys with voices breaking. Just as good as a roar are silent signals, the messages written in invisible ink on notice boards of tree, grass or bush. Lions get their pedicures and bark, raking talons keeps them sharp by stripping off worn outer layers. And scent glands between the toes may also paste up chemical messages. Males are particularly keen to check who's been by and superimpose their own mark. If you live in a group, it's a good idea to stay friends, and body talk's a fine way to do it. Close physical contact achieves the same end in lion society as in human.
after a friendly, respectful sniff, which also checks out status, a good lick. Even the roughest sandpaper can't match a lion's tongue. A few judicious licks with something that can strip skin from a dead animal do an excellent job of winking out dirt and parasites. And licking is part of the glue that binds the group. And if you live in a group, order in the ranks is a good idea too. This female is irritated, but she bows to superior muscle power. Though the lion may be saying he's in command, the real decision makers in this society are the females. Young lions are great at body talk. Playtime is full of it as the cubs learn what group life is all about and train for a hunting profession. Some of the key notices in lion language are pinned up by females on heat. These are pungent invitations written in urine, which the pride's resident males read with great interest. A female litters her trail with them. He has a gland in the roof of his mouth that interprets her messages very precisely. Grimacing like this, he gives the gland maximum exposure to increased estrogen in the female's urine. Scent molecules of it hang in the air and lie on the grass. mistaking what's said at mealtimes. This lioness knows she's not welcome. Sometimes a kill gets them so excited the lions paw the ground round it in a misplaced scent marking activity. Lion talk can be powerful stuff and when they let rip Everyone sits up and takes notice. It might seem a breeze being Africa's top carnivore, and it is when they've killed and can't eat another thing. Then they live in peace with the neighbors, but the neighbors are always aware of them. The bustard needn't fear, this lion's just taking a walk. A lion's prey can tell the difference between a lion lazing and a lion giving the menu a look over. A lion settling down is a lion in neutral. A 
giraffe can drink without fear. No lion's going to jump it now it's midday and too hot to move. They're all sleeping it off. Cats are notoriously curious. This stone on legs needs checking out. Is it playing with the tortoise, or looking for a snack? Could be either. Lions have few enemies, mostly disease, each other, and people. Snares and traps kill lions, even if not meant to, yet they may recover from appalling wounds. Lions and tigers are the cat world's only regular man-eaters, but usually they avoid people. Very wise in respect of East Africa's Maasai tribe, their ultimate test of manhood and bravery was to kill a lion just with a spear. But this ancient rite of passage no longer exists. Since the 1970s, Kenya has protected its lions. So, is a lion's life easy? Though he might reach the ripe old age of 14, a male's can be full of punch-ups and aggro. A female can manage 17 years, years full of child-minding, risking life and limb in the hunt, and warring with neighbors. But the upside is their unique social lifestyle. Their prides give them greater strength, hunting prowess, and success. Perhaps solidarity is why these great cats are where they are top of Africa's food chain, kings of the carnivores. won't eat the buffalo calf here, they'll drag it clear. The pride gathers round. The cubs are still headed on a relative. An experimental throat tackle. Something it will eventually do on prey. Hunting is learned and genetically hardwired and instinctive. It's never too soon to find out why bark grows on trees. To keep a lion's claws sharp. But at this age, on a milk diet, toothpicks are unnecessary. Older cubs are above such child's play. They're into learning how to knock down prey. Only not the real thing just yet. The older they get, the rougher they play. 
claws are sheathed, but a playful swipe has substantial muscle behind it. It's a little early, though, to try out some lessons. Growing up in this society is all about learning how to survive, and that revolves around food. Lions are seriously laid back. When they're not out looking for a bite, they're snoozing, which is most of the time. Most humans know where their next meal's coming from. A lion doesn't. So lazing makes sense. It saves energy. Plus, a lion's heart is small relative to its size, so if it rushed about all day, it'd easily overheat. But when it's time to hunt, gone is all shred of indolence. A big, solid predator like a lion relies on sneaking close to prey before the surprise assault. Especially important in a wide open place like the Serengeti. Hunting strategy number one. Lie down and lull them into a false sense of security. And she's already been forgotten. Now she starts to stalk. First class muscle control and an extremely supple, flexible spine enable her to move like this. There's a way there's no one to watch over them. Her bundles of fluff are now old enough to join the pride, where there's not just mum to keep an eye on them. In a close unit like the Pride, lionesses look after each other's cubs, attention seekers that need discipline. <coughs> Even non-related females will put up with typical cheeky kittenish behavior if it doesn't go too far. <coughs> So close is the pride bond that females with cubs the same age happily pool their resources. They play and groom and suckle across the board. It's a real working commune with plenty of childminders. One of the first things a new male coalition does when it takes over is kill young cubs. This is not cruelty nor viciousness, but a simple, overwhelming need to breed, a drink to help digestion. The pride has hardly finished eating when in come the keenest eyed scavengers, the vultures. They can spot a far distant lion kill from high in the air. Some diners are still at it, but the vultures will head the food queue. Surprisingly, lions themselves scavenge as much as 30% of their food in the dry season. They can see circling vultures two kilometers off and know exactly what it means.
across the board. It's a real working commune with plenty of childminders. One of the first things a new male coalition does when it takes over is kill young cubs. This is not cruelty nor viciousness, but a simple overwhelming need to breed. With no young to rear, the females will mate again. Both have the same drive to pass on their genes. So a pride may have several litters the same age, or with perhaps one shared parent. And their bond leads the females to share cub care, even down to suckling. When it's about three months old, a cub starts having a crack at stalking. This is a basic lesson in catching food and earning its keep. First experiments are always conducted on a relative. An experimental throat tackle, something it'll eventually do on prey. Hunting is learned and genetically hardwired and instinctive. It's never too soon to find out why bark grows on trees, to keep a lion's claws sharp. Running water can make a lion's life a lot more comfortable, and water in the dry season has the pull of a city's bright lights. Lions can't resist them because water holes are where the prey is, and because lions need water, like everyone else. A big bull elephant is about the only animal able to lay down the law to a lion. One nil to the elephant. Conflict is a fact of life in the dry season, when everyone's after the same evaporating lifelines. Hot and thirsty lions just have to sit and swelter. Zimbabwe's Mana Now here comes the rest of the family. Keen to help, but youth and inexperience make them more of a hindrance. won't eat the buffalo calf here, they'll drag it clear. but the neighbors are always aware of them. The busted needn't fear. This lion's just taking a walk. 
A lion's prey can tell the difference between a lion lazing and a lion giving the menu a look over. A lion settling down is a lion in neutral. A giraffe can drink without fear. No lion's going to jump it now it's midday and too hot to move. They're all sleeping it off. Cats are notoriously curious. This stone on legs needs checking out. four kilometers. Lions roar most at dusk and dawn because that's when sound carries best and both sexes roar, not just the male. A roar can be an invisible barbed wire fence to demarcate a territory and warn off intruders. Roars are also contact calls. Animals that live in groups need a way of telling the others who they are and where they are over a distance. A full-blooded roar only comes with adulthood. Lions often roar in chorus. The first of these cats was no bigger than a domestic cat, but probably behaved like an African wild cat. This early species did well, fed by a population explosion of rats and mice. And from those first felids of eight million years ago came all of today's wild cats, including lions. Lions are seriously laid back. When they're not out looking for a bite, they're snoozing, which is most of the time. Most humans know where their next meal's coming from. A lion doesn't. So lazing makes sense. It saves energy. Plus, a lion's heart is small relative to its size, so if it rushed about all day, it'd easily overheat. But when it's time to hunt, gone is all shred of indolence. A big, solid predator like a lion relies on sneaking close. The pride gathers round. The cubs are still hesitant and awkward, but they'll quickly learn what to do by copying their elders. Buffalo is normally too big and dangerous for a lioness to tackle alone, but a calf separated from its mother was easy game. Meal times have a pecking order. Normally, adults feed first. Today, they stand back and allow the cubs to. The cubs 
dogs don't show the same good manners towards each other. So a pride may have several litters the same age, or with perhaps one shared parent. And their bond leads the females to share cub care, even down to suckling. When it's about three months old, a cub starts having a crack at stalking. This is a basic lesson in catching food and earning its keep. First experiments are always conducted on a relative. An experimental throat tackle, something it will eventually do on prey. Hunting is learned and genetically hardwired and instinctive. It's never too soon to find out why bark grows on trees, to keep a lion's claws sharp. But at this age, on a milk diet, toothpicks are unnecessary. Older cubs are above such child's play. They're into learning how to knock down prey. Only not the real thing just yet. The older they get, the rougher they play. Chief breadwinners for the pride are the females. They often use teamwork to hunt. A pincer tactic by two may cut off escape. Warthogs don't see very well, and they frequently trot right into a pride without even noticing, until it's too late. There's a lineup of keen and hungry spectators. There won't be much to go round, but they all move in. a scrap of warthog will be left, not even tusks. The downside of group life is that meals must be shared. In places where there's a long dry season, many prides rely on warthogs to tide them over until the rains. After a meal, a drink to help.